There are loads of videos that exist to explain what an NFT is, but in our view, most of them are a little bit too technical, a bit complex, uh, a bit too advanced. They assume quite a bit of upfront knowledge, which I don't have, and I'm assuming that many of you won't have either. So I want to explain to you what we think NFTs are in a fairly simple way. Hi, my name is Rory Blaine. I'm the director and CEO of Sedition, the world's leading platform to collect, share, trade, display and enjoy art in digital format from the world's leading contemporary artists. Today I want to explain to you what NFTs are in the simplest way I can. What does it mean, NFT? Well, the abbreviation stands for non-fungible token. What does this mean? While the words fungible or fungibility are not the most commonly used words in the English language, they are quite common if you've ever worked in finance or the City of London. Uh, it's typically attached to financially traded derivatives or things happening within the finance domain. So it's no accident that these words are being attached to cryptocurrencies and NFTs. What fungible actually means is simply exchangeable, swappable, like for like. Uh, Non-fungible means non-exchangeable, irreplaceable, unique, one of a kind. So everything in the world comes under the heading of being either fungible or not fungible. Swappable or not swappable on a like-for-like -like basis. For example, <coughs> a £10 note. I can take a £10 note and I could swap it for two £5 notes. Now, they're not exactly the same thing, but they represent the same thing. They have the same value. Though portrayed in a slightly different way, changing two £5 notes into a £10 note isn't going to change anything. Changing a £10 note into 10 £1 coins isn't going to change anything. It doesn't leave anyone out of pocket. It doesn't change much of anything, really. Your buying power stays the same as it was before. So those things are fungible. They're swappable on a like-for-like -like basis. You can change them over and swap them out without loss or concern to either party. Now, there are many other things in the world that also count as fungible objects. Uh, gold, for example, is fungible. Completely interchangeable and replaceable. Um, so if you have a kilo of gold sitting on your desk, uh, well, great, and I'll be around to collect it very shortly. But kidding aside, if you have a kilo of gold, then you can swap it out for two 500 gram bars of gold. You can swap it out for 10 100 gram bars of gold or any other variation on that theme. Same value, same ultimate amount of gold, it's completely changeable or swappable, or in other words, it's completely fungible. So on the other side of that argument, what are non-replaceable, one-off, unique or non-fungible items? Obviously there's a lot of things around the world that are non-fungible or non-replaceable. And actually art usually is considered to be one of those, which is why it's interesting that uh, NFTs or non-fungible tokens are, are being used to attach to artworks. So why is art non-fungible? Well, because generally speaking, you're normally looking at unique objects, one of a kinds. Um, the edition world is different. Um, editions were designed to be multiples of the same object. But art normally, I mean, let's look at uh, uh, one of the most famous paintings out there. Let's take the Mona Lisa. Incredibly well-known image. Everyone knows it. Hundreds of millions of pictures of it. Now, if you go into the Louvre in Paris and you take your camera, point it at the Mona Lisa and take a picture, you're not going to swap it out for the picture on the wall and say, OK, you guys keep this one here, I'll take the Mona Lisa with me, we're all good. The Louvre aren't going to be happy, uh, quite understandably. It's not the same. It's not exchangeable. One can't be replaced for another, no matter how many different images there are of it out there. It's not changeable for anything else. There's only the one Mona Lisa. Now, that's a very obvious example, but there are many other items that are non-fungible or non-replaceable things as well. Uh, these might be items that have an emotional or a sacramental value. Uh, there are probably many things from your childhood, um, old family heirlooms, family albums, bits of furniture. Things might have an enormous amount of emotional value and worth tied up in them. These things are not fungible. They're not replaceable. There is no like-for-like -like equivalent that you can swap them out with. So again, that's what a non-fungible object is. Simply something that can't be swapped out for another thing on a like-for-like -like basis. It's really that simple. If you ignore the slightly unusual fungi, spore, fungible words, then it's pretty simple. By the way, unsurprisingly, non-fungible objects, non-swappable objects, mostly unique objects, do tend to command far higher prices than fungible objects. So we've figured out what fungible and non-fungible is, and attached to those terms, something else you're going to hear quite a lot of is tokens. So what is a token? 
Well, in order to understand a token, I first need to cover another concept, which is, what is a blockchain? So what is a blockchain? All right, the best way to think about a blockchain is to think about how your financial transactions are usually carried out. And let me just say up front here that this is a gross oversimplification. There's a lot more going on under the bonnet and behind the scenes that I'm going to tell you about here. But basically, if you go into a shop and you choose to buy something, you're going to put your credit card on the counter and then you pay for the item. And when you do that, behind the scenes, uh, your credit card is sending its information to the bank. The bank is checking your accounts and it's making sure you've got enough funds in the account to meet that transaction. Can you afford to buy what you're looking to do buy right now? And if you can, your bank will agree and then it will send that information and transfer your money from your account into the vendor or shopkeeper's account. Uh, and it'll keep a record of all those transactions, either with that vendor or any other different vendors that you may have bought things from. It keeps a running balance, a total credit score of what your debits and credits are at any given moment. Now this is obvious and it's second nature. It's what we've all grown up with and what we're used to buying and selling in the world in which we live. So this is what banks do. They keep a track of each and every transaction that we make and they send data to and from one another to make sure that we're all on the same page and that everyone understands what credit and debits you have in your account. As we move further and further away from using cash, uh, money becomes more and more just the numbers on the screen, rather than the physical currency and the notes that underpin it. Let's look at what a blockchain does. Essentially, blockchain is doing all the same things that your bank currently does, but it does it without having to trust a single centralized entity like your bank. For example, if you're going to buy something and instead of using the bank, you use blockchain, then that information to check that your account has enough money in there to tell the world that that money has now moved from your account to the vendor's account, the blockchain does all of that for you. And it doesn't just do it in one centralized system, in one centralized place. Um, it basically does it in a decentralized system, a decentralized ledger, which is being verified by different players all around the world, spread out all over the place. So essentially, the blockchain is just a bunch of records. It's a continually growing and updating and expanding bunch of records, data, lots and lots of transactions that have ever taken place, and it's a public ledger to show you the movement of those funds. That's what makes it so good. That's why it's dependable. It no longer asks you to trust anyone or anything, like your bank. We've grown up with the idea of this, this placing our trust in a single centralized entity. We're pretty used to this. I trust my bank. I don't think my bank is about to suddenly disappear and go bankrupt and my accounts vanish from the planet, but it is still a risk. However small it is, historically speaking, it has happened. Across the world, there have been many runs on banks and many financial institution collapses. We've seen the results of the recent crashes in our financial systems. It's not that common, but it is still a risk. It's the problem of having a centralized system to look after it all. The blockchain takes this idea and it spreads the risk out. If you have your jewels and your valuables and you put them into a security deposit box and put them in your bank, then great, that's pretty safe. It's a good idea. But if the thieves want it, and they do, then they're gonna find a way to get to it. They're gonna drill into the bank and steal the, the safety deposit boxes. For example, there was a diamond heist in London. Um, it's very ingenious. They'll find a way of drilling in, emptying the deposit box and walking away. Again, it's not that common but it is a risk, and that's the risk of a centralized system. The blockchain takes that risk and it spreads it out. It takes those valuables and all those diamonds and it puts them, instead of into one safety deposit box, it puts them into thousands of different places. Now, there's no point in a team of people drilling into the bank's vaults or any single centralized location. They'd have to do the same thing thousands of times in thousands of places all over the world, which makes it kind of impossible. You can't break into a bank and drill into the safety deposit box anymore. Now it's an operation that would take a global team of thousands of people. It's no longer worth doing. Realistically, the cost of doing it would be higher than the reward of doing it. So that's the idea behind a blockchain. It makes everything more stable, a little easier, more transparent, less subject to fraud. And it has less problems in assuming risk. The risk is distributed rather than being housed in one single place. Hundreds of thousands of locations across the world versus one. That is why the blockchain is more secure. Uh, that's why the idea of one safe in your house versus thousands of safes in thousands of houses, it's an obvious difference. And this is what the blockchain is about. So what does this have to do with tokens? All right, nothing yet, but I promise we're getting there. So 
The most interesting thing about blockchain is that these records that are written in the blockchain can be about anything. It doesn't just have to be about money, uh, financial transactions, anything that you want to record can be listed on the blockchain. It could be the fact that you own a particular video or a specific photograph. It's very transparent, it's very easy, people can access it from anywhere and they can see who owns what. Since when have they owned it? How much did they pay for it? When did that transaction happen? The transactional history is all right there. It's a far more trustworthy, transparent and, we believe, acceptable system to use. So to review, when you're listing something on the blockchain, that's what the crypto community currently calls minting or creating an NFT. That's all it is. What you're really doing there is, is creating a ledger that says, I own this item and making sure that everyone on that chain knows that you own that item as of this date because of this transaction for this much money. That's what an NFT is. It's a statement, a token, a saying, a note saying that this is the current situation. This is the statement of fact uh, and here's how things stand. A token after all is a symbol of ownership, a record uh, by entering information on the blockchain that you own a specific video, a specific image or a specific piece of art you're creating a non-fungible token, an NFT. It sounds complex, but it's actually that simple. The non-fungible tokens themselves, NFTs, are in and of themselves, and this part may surprise you, worthless. There's no intrinsic value attached to them. Basically, it's whatever the market says it will be. So the owner of an artwork chooses to list uh, on the blockchain, they've turned it into an NFT. Now that doesn't actually mean anything. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything at all until ultimately when they choose to sell that work again in the future. What it means is simply that they are listing themselves as the current owner. And what that means going forward is if they ever choose to sell that work, then that NFT, when it sells, the artist in this case, the originator of the work, will receive a fair resale value every time that work sells again. From then and from now on in perpetuity. Now for us at Sedition, this is brilliant. This is something we've been wanting for as long as we're in business. We've all been very aware of the apocryphal story of the penniless artist who becomes a genius and sells his works. And then those works slowly accrue in value and years later they sell for millions and the collectors who bought them get very rich and the artist dies as a pauper. Now, that's a scenario that's not so likely to happen in today's world as it has been historically. The route to market for an artist today is, is much easier than it's ever been before. Um, so that scenario is unlikely, or at least the extremes of those scenarios uh, makes it unlikely. But it's still very much the case that an artist can essentially be excluded from the accrual of price and the rising value of their work that they did in their early career years. NFTs and the idea of recapturing a fair chunk of that secondary market sale is a brilliant, unbelievably overdue development in the art world. This is, I think, one of the most important developments to occur in the art market for the last 50 to 100 years. Every artist in the world should be singing the praises of this technology. Again, it grooves trust. You don't need a gallery. You don't need centrification. You don't need a representative. You don't need a collection agency or anyone collecting money and passing it back to you. You simply need to make sure that your work is attached to an NFT and then every time it changes hands in the future, a resale value will accrue back to you for every transaction thereafter. For us, we believe this is game changing. So in the long run, NFTs are a brilliant development, but it's not all good yet. One of the reasons that we've taken our time to get into this point is because it doesn't do everything that we want of it yet. And at the moment, we do still have some concerns. One of the things we're concerned about, and we know that we share this concern with many of the artists and users of our platform and, and users of NFTs around the world, is the fact that there's quite a significant ecological impact attached to the technology at the moment. Now, this is one of the things certainly that stayed our hand up until now, but these things are being resolved as we speak. Um, another difficulty that we also have is that uh, with everything that's happened so far, there's an awful lot of confusion around what is an NFT and what it really means and what it will mean in the future. Now, this is one of the reasons we're stepping into this, because now more than ever, we think that this space really needs a, an art-centric, curated, artist-focused platform. Despite all of our concerns, I really think that the technology is going to become the go-to technology, and not just for digital assets, but actually for record-keeping across the board, in all media. So to wrap this up, an NFT, or non-fungible token, is nothing more than a record on the blockchain. It's a public ledger of transactions related to the ownership of a digital file. 
It stores information about who created the file, when it was created, when and where it was sold, for what price, and who owns the file right now. A final thought. The most common misconception about NFTs is that it's an image, or a GIF, or video. In my view, a much better way to look at NFTs is that it's just information, stored on the blockchain, which everyone can see. It tells them about who created a digital asset, and it tells them uh, who owns it now. Hopefully you have a slightly better understanding of what NFTs are, and more importantly, what they're not. Also, please do check out some of our other videos related to Ethereum, which is one of the most important blockchains in the world, on which most NFTs at the moment are operational. And do have a look at the other video we've put out about Metamask, which is one of the most important tools you'll need to access the world of NFTs. I hope you enjoyed this, and we hope it was helpful. This was Rory, the director of Sedition, the platform to collect, share, trade, display, and enjoy art by the world's leading contemporary artists. Stay tuned with Sedition.